the former Commonwealth Secretary General. Uh, during his tenure as Secretary General, he led the Commonwealth support to Maldives' transition to multi-party democracy. He previously broke, um, brokered a peace accord in uh, Bougainville, Papua New Guinea, uh, for which he was nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize. Sir Donald has been decorated with the highest award in New Zealand, Order of New Zealand, and also by H.N. the Queen, uh, head of the Commonwealth and the Knight Grand Cross of the Royal Victorian Order. Sir Donald Mackinnon uh, uh, served as a member of the New Zealand Parliament from 1978 to 2000. Apart from holding the post of Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Foreign Affairs and Trade, Sir Donald also served as Minister of Pacific Island Affairs and Minister of Disarmament and Arms Control. So you will have around 30 to 40 minutes to make your initial remarks, which will be followed by questions and answers. We'd like to request all our participants to drop their questions in the Zoom box or on the Facebook Live. The floor is yours, sir. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. And thank you very much to all of you that are listening here in Nepal. Um, it's, uh, this seems to be the way we have uh, much communication these days. It is a strange way of communicating, but I think it's a very effective way of communicating. But I could say, having been involved in international relations for something like uh, 20 years of active and operational activity, you cannot beat face-to-face -face discussions and negotiations, especially when you're dealing with difficult issues. But thank you anyway, and I certainly admire the work that you're doing, your international body. You've, you've done a wide range of studies throughout South Asia and particularly in relation to China. And that is very relevant to all of us today, wherever you are in the world, China has an impact on your, on your activities and your, your own studies in terms of peace, in terms of reconciliation, in terms of China's strategic uh, aspirations. Uh, it's all very, very good reading. And I would hope many others get the opportunity to, to so follow. You've asked me to talk about uh, multilateralism uh, in, in the Asia Pacific. And of course, uh, immediately I'm taken back to when I first became a foreign minister, which was in 1990. And then of course, we were immediately engulfed in the whole, um, under the whole umbrella of APEC. But to really talk about multilateralism in the Asia Pacific, I felt there's a need to go back even further because it kind of paints a more accurate picture and it gives you a, a probably more graphic reason why the Asia Pacific has ended up where it is today in uh, 2020. So I only, I only want to take you back to the uh, end of the Second World War which was the starting point for a lot of different activity in the Asia Pacific. But by beginning at that point, it does give you a greater understanding of the breadth of activity in the Asia Pacific and why it did occur. You will remember, of course, that at the end of World War II, and I, when I say you will remember, I mean, I'm getting pretty old, and I was, uh, I was about six years old when World War II ended, and I do actually remember the date when Japan surrendered. But that's the beginning point. Japan was devastated. The, most of the nations of Southeast Asia suffered dramatically. The Pacific Islands, many Pacific Islands suffered terribly. Australia and New Zealand were obviously affected by it. And so by 1946, of course, everyone is kind of in a, in a aura of peace, but where do we go from here? Well, Japan, of course, uh, was the major economic power in the Pacific up until that time. And with the assistance of the United States and under a whole new constitution, it was actively rebuilt and rebuilt very successfully, uh, more by the Japanese people than, of course, by, by, by the Americans, but under the umbrella of that 
post-World War peaceful period of time. Also, of course, at the same time, we were moving towards a, a dichotomy within the world of were you in the West or were you in the, uh, in, under communism or were you non-aligned? And for those of you folk in your part of the world, of course, India stood out very strongly as a non-aligned nation. Nevertheless, once Japan really started to wind up its economy in a very strong way, it actually led the other nations of Southeast Asia. And we used to describe Japan as uh, the, front, the front goose of a flying geese. And you know, geese always fly in a, a, v, a V sort of a syndrome. And Japan was that lead goose and behind that of course were Taiwan and Singapore and behind that was Thailand, Malaysia and behind that was Cambodia and Laos and, uh, and uh, Vietnam. But Japan really pulled those nations forward and that became quite a dramatic development in North Asia and Southeast Asia. Sorry, I forgot about Korea. Korea was one of those early, early active ones. The result of all this was, of course, people were ignoring China. And it wasn't until, what, 1973, 74, when uh, Deng Xiaoping and China decided to open up China, that people started to take China very seriously. And so rightly so, because uh, as people have always said, when China wakes up, uh, everyone will be very surprised. So, that everything was moving, you might say, in the right direction. There was a, a huge amount of trade between Southeast Asia and North Asia, with the exception of China, and to the United States and Europe. And this is where you, the, this was the beginnings of, of multilateral trade in the Pacific. Just those led by Japan, principally followed by the uh, Korea and, and other Southeast Asian nations, uh, moving ahead quite dramatically. And then of course, China decided they should be part of that too. So why did all this happen at this time? Well, people realized that trade in a country, trade within a single country is not going to produce a lot of wealth people selling to each other in two or three cities in your own country doesn't create a lot of wealth. What creates wealth is when you're selling outside your country, when you are trading with other countries, when you're taking advantage of the, uh, uh, you know, your own comparative advantage is when things start to really develop. So by this time, and I'm talking we're leaping ahead from 1945 right into the 1980s. And, and by that time, the 1980s, of course, the West in generally became much more secure. It was secure on the basis of what happened after World War II. And if there are a num the number of things that happened after World War II, which are still impacting on the world today, and I ask you to just think about this very carefully. After World War II, the creation of the United Nations, the establishment of NATO, the establishment and the development slowly of the European Union. The, under the United Nations flag, of course, the World Bank was established, the IMF was established, the courts of justice were established. So, what was suddenly within our environment, and this was really what the, the West generally was resting upon, was a grouping of institutions that were supporting the liberal democracies. Now that's fine to a certain point, but being a liberal democracy doesn't necessarily bring you any great degree of wealth. Uh, what brings you wealth is economic activity. And what brings you greater wealth is that economic activity 
is inter-country, inter-region, trading between countries, trading between regions. And that's where things really uh, change very dramatically. And there's soon a, a realization that this economic growth to be sustained really needed other nations to come to agreements with each other. And I'm still just talking now about a, a quite a limited Asia Pacific. And I talk about a limited Asia Pacific, I'm talking uh, United States and Canada on one side, Japan, Korea, and the ASEAN nations on the other side, along with Australia and New Zealand. It was quite a small grouping of nations. And of course, the one great absentee was China. And how soon before China would become more relevant to the whole issue of uh, managed international trade. So countries began to realize that just selling to each other within the country was going to allow people to get fed and clothed and housed, but it wasn't going to really lift economic growth. People selling within the country doesn't lift economic growth substantially at all. So you end up with specialist areas of growth according to uh, competitive advantage, comparative advantage, and therefore I sell to country B because I can do it better than country B and I buy from country B because they do something better than me. It's a, very, it's a, it's a, it's a pretty fundamental economic principle which I know you all understand. But the alternative, of course, is just a race to the bottom. However, of course, once people start trading with each other, that obviously from time to time makes local manufacturers a little bit nervous because you know, manufacturer says, well, I, I was producing this for all my people. Now someone's coming in and producing at half the price. And consequently, we start seeing the emergence of barriers to international trade. And these barriers, uh, I suppose you could say quite justified because they are preventing a degree of hurt for some people. And hence a uh, combination of tariffs, of licenses, of quotas started to emerge. Now, how to deal with this? Because people knew that the more international trade that occurred, the more economic wealth was created. But how do you manage the politics of your local manufacturers who may believe they're doing the right thing, but in fact are getting underpriced by someone else. Then of course, countries start talking to one another and we began with what became known as the GATT, the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trades, uh, a means of trying to establish uh, rules around tariffs and the trade accordingly that allowed as much trade as possible, but limiting the tariff ability. Not an easy thing because you get caught up in not only international economics, but international legal systems. And uh, how does one country tell another what they should or should not do? How does one international organization say to uh, a country, well, we think you should uh, reduce your uh, production of those particular goods because uh, you can buy them cheaper elsewhere and you should be taking advantage of what you do best. So that was a difficult period, but ultimately countries could see that the use of some management on tariffs and licenses and quotas worldwide was something that has to be pursued and so slowly emerged the World Trade Organization. A wonderful aspiration, but probably an aspiration that was beyond total ability to achieve, simply because what have we now? 193 countries around the world. Will 193 countries ever agree on anything together? Fairly remote. And as we found out, there, were, there was a successful 
a, WT, a WTO round, the Uruguay round. The next one, the Doha round, just didn't kind of move the way people expected it to do. However, as a result of this, and here I'm finally, uh, Mr. Chairman, getting to the point that, I, that you'd want me to get to, how does this affect the Asia Pacific? But that, that's the, what I've tried to give you is the background of where the Asia Pacific ended up. Uh, a lot of successful economies, Japan particularly, China beginning to move, Thailand, Malaysia, Korea doing very well, Singapore doing very well. And, and so they all kept moving, Australia, New Zealand kept moving. So can we not look at a more local grouping to talk about trade within a region which has more ability to manage its own issues of tariffs and barriers and trade problems than trying to deal with the whole world. And whilst there was in the Pacific, the Pacific Economic uh, Cooperation Council, which was a, a voluntary body, which uh, did a lot of quite economic uh, work, uh, there was the Pacific Basin Economic Council, which included uh, Mexico, which also did uh, a lot of useful uh, work and encouraging people in this direction. But it was ultimately the organization became known as APEC in 1989, which was established. And I was one of those very lucky ones that I was with APEC as a minister from the beginning. And I attended some nine or 10 APEC meetings before I finally resigned as a foreign minister. So I saw it grow. And when it began, it was just Australia, New Zealand, it was Canada, the United States, it was Japan, Korea, and some of the ASEAN nations. It was, it, I think it was only about 13 nations. But we began with the purpose of saying, well, if the WTO can't manage things for the whole world, what can we in the Asia Pacific do? And that was the starting point of some very useful movements uh, within the Asia Pacific. Now, very soon after I, my first meeting, of course, I uh, found that, um, you know, there was already moves underfoot. How do we bring in China? Now, of course, with the advent of the strong influence of the United States, they said, we'd, we'd love to have China there, but we'd also love to have Taiwan and Hong Kong there. And so a deal was done very much by the Koreans to bring in what we call the three Chinas. China came in and allowed Hong Kong and Taiwan to come in because this was an economic forum. It wasn't to be a political forum. It wasn't to be a security forum. It was an economic forum. And so they came in. And then I initiated uh, from the point of view of being one of the newest also, if we are truly Asia Pacific, what about Mexico? What about Chile? What about Peru? What about Papua New Guinea? And I was glad to say that uh, in my early time, I was able to bring in uh, Chile, Mexico and Papua New Guinea. Uh, I couldn't, uh, we couldn't get over the line with Peru at the time, but to me that represented a much more balanced Asia Pacific. Because as you know, uh, although you're in the mountain kingdom of Nepal, you know very well that the Asia Pacific takes in a huge number of uh, countries, uh, economies, uh, dynamic and otherwise. So, the economic benefits was what people were looking for. People joined APEC, countries joined APEC in order to see the economic benefits. And so APEC moved very rapidly. Uh, the American behest, of course, uh, uh, Russia soon became uh, part of it. Uh, but of course, nothing ever stands still. And once everyone was kind of satisfied that uh, this was a very good body to discuss economic issues, who is discussing security issues? Who is discussing some of the very sensitive uh, military type issues in the Asia Pacific? Well, APEC didn't want to do it. 
But the ASEAN countries decided there had to be a there had to be a forum for these security issues. And the consequence of that was, and again, I was very lucky to be in on the ground floor here, was the development of the ASEAN Regional Forum. The ASEAN Regional Forum, of course, uh, uh, everyone knew was particularly designed to talk about security issues. And the important thing was that those countries for which there were sensitivity about security issues, particularly Indonesia over East Timor, particularly China, uh, agreed for the ASEAN Regional Forum to develop. And so the Regional Forum, this became almost equally as important as APEC. But again, the, the point that I'm making to you is these issues grow incrementally. You could not have started a level of multilateralism in the Asia Pacific, which included the economic, the social, and the security issues. But step by step, uh, the ASEAN Regional Forum grew. APEC continued uh, for quite some time. And of course, as you probably know, there was some stalling later on when the, the, the feeling was that uh, uh, nations became a little bit more nationalistic. But nevertheless, what it proved was that if, if nations are prepared to sit down and work together with a defined uh, agenda, with some clear objectives, ultimately they can get there. You don't do it in six months or even one year. But I remember in one of the, uh, one of the APEC meetings that Indonesia said, we agree to that trade liberalization, but we need three more years to get there three years beyond others' ability to get there. And the simple thing is not to argue with Indonesia, just to say, okay, as long as you're moving ahead on trade liberalization, opening your economy, encouraging others to trade with you, you know, we're quite happy. And so the way that APEC developed was a very good model. But nothing ever stands still. After all, APEC could not have been developed in, the, uh, in Europe. In fact, the EU is a totally different animal. It's, uh, it's much more cohesive. It's much more militarily based. And of course, within Asia, you have that many more uh, inherent conflicts before you even start. But nevertheless, the countries of APEC, as wide as they were, from Latin America to North America, from North Asia to Southeast Asia and round to South, South Asia. Uh, and as you would know, uh, India's played a part, Myanmar's played a part, others have come in uh, to be involved in this very vibrant body. Well, I've got to keep moving because you want to ask some questions, but here we are in 2020. Where do we go from here? Uh, your own organization has done a lot of studies and I'm glad they've had wide circulation on the development of activities in China particularly. Uh, the trade, of course, the way, the way India has, uh, has uh, spread itself uh, very remarkably. There is not the same consensus to multilateral trade as what there was probably 15 years ago. But it still is, <clears throat> and I emphasize this very strongly, multilateralism for trade and economic activity is still the strive, strongest driver for peace and prosperity in a region. The more countries are interlinked through trade and other economic activity, the less likely they are to be in combat with each other. But we've also hit the negatives of globalization. And globalization, unfortunately, has brought to the fore those that are saying, this is, I'm talking about political leadership, political leadership that is saying, we are being crucified by globalization. We are suffering from globalization. Look, it's more of a political strapline 
than it is an economic truth, but it is there. It has grown a degree of populism. It has grown protests around the world. It has increased nationalism. Uh, all of these things are on the march. So the ability to achieve more in the field of economic inter-country trade for the time being has slowed right down. I don't expect it to pick up very rapidly, but some countries will continue to grow economically, as is China, as is Korea, as is Thailand, as is Australia and New Zealand, as is many other countries. But the ability to come to various agreements is not going to be easy. And of course, now we are beset by this pandemic that maybe only 10 people in the world knew about in January this year. But there it is, it's with us now. And it's changed everything. And it will continue to change everything for some time. But nevertheless, I finish my discussion with you by saying this, that it, it still exists. The sine qua non of future trade policy must include a rules-based order. It must acknowledge some degree of independent sovereignty. It must, agree, it must acknowledge some degree of a loss of sovereignty. It must allow diversity. It must allow some political autonomy. And it must sustain to universal values. So that's a lot to ask for. And it must not try and beggar thy neighbor. It must not create a situation where you take advantage of a poorer neighbor and make them even poorer. That is not good for the future of the world. And I finish on the quote, which I remember a man I met many times and had great admiration for, one Nelson Mandela, when he said, if your neighbor is hungry, you can't possibly be secure. So we've got to make sure that our neighbors are not hungry. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Uh, right Honorable Sir Donald Macken, thank you very much for your enlightening presentation. We all learned a lot today. Uh, we, we have got also got lots of questions from the floor. So without wasting much time, let me directly uh, go to the questions. The first question is how America's hegemony and rise of China impact Asia-Pacific multilateralism? Well, it has had quite a strong effect, but only, a, only by way of sort of stalling activity. It has not been helpful for the United States to put up barriers against uh, a lot of Asia-Pacific countries. It has not helped anyone in the Asia Pacific for there to be this uh, rigorous, strong debate between, between the United States and China. This is just not helpful. Now, when the, uh, as the, the saying goes, and you'd be familiar, when elephants are fighting, all the little animals get crushed. Uh, the best thing the little animals can do is probably just keep quiet for a while, but continue to voice their concerns that conflict between major powers has a debilitating effect on everybody. And those countries have got to be encouraged not to heighten this tension because people do not like that kind of tension. Thank you, sir. Uh, the next question is how multilateralism has played its role in changing the contours of Asia-Pacific and, and please throw la some light on multilateralism uh, uh, after the pandemic. Well, that again, you see, as I said before, multilateralism in the Asia-Pacific was moving at a pretty good pace. Uh, uh, it began to slow down when a number of countries believed it was causing them more harm. It wasn't so much the Asia Pacific trade was causing them harm, it was globalization they were worried about. Uh, but the consequence of that, that begin, began this uh, 
nationalistic feelings in, in many parts that, uh, no, I, I'm not sure I want to stay with this if it's going to make, me, make my country suffer. So I think we're in for a slow recovery. It's a slow recovery because the, the, the pendulum of politics never stays still. Clearly, the pendulum is still swinging in favour of a degree of populism, a degree of nationalism, a degree of I'm better to go it alone. Uh, that is taking us back 30, 40 years. Uh, the world cannot continue like that. So it is a matter for those who still believe that um, international trade is important for economic growth to continue to speak out. Uh, however, I think we've got, probably got to get past the uh, American elections in a few weeks' time before people might be more vocal about that issue. Uh, the next question is, where does New Zealand situate itself in the emerging Indo-Pacific regional security order? Yes, that's a, um, I, well, having been in politics now for uh, the better part of um, 45 years, you see a lot of things come and go. You see a lot of things changing. Uh, nothing, nothing ever remains the same. New Zealand was confronted with some very major economic issues back in the 60s and 70s when the United Kingdom decided to join the, what was then the common market. And New Zealand, having had a large proportion of its trade with the United Kingdom, and I'm talking 70% of our trade was with the United Kingdom. We had to spread ourselves far more widely. The result, and we did, we did very actively. We sought out markets all over the world. The result of that was our trade with the United Kingdom is now under 4%, from 70% down to 4%. So what I mean by this point is we, have become quite practiced in dealing with large economic entities and making sure that we can be successful. We don't want to have to take sides between the United States and China. We know China very well. We know the United States very well. We have a huge amount of trade with China. We have a huge amount of trade with the United States. And we'll be saying to both those countries, you know, you've got to get along together. We can't have a situation where one country decides it must be the dominant force forever. Uh, China has caught up amazingly, given that uh, you know, China was a major economic power in the 16th century. Uh, when I became foreign minister, its, uh, it's GDP vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world was about 3%. Now it's about 25%. So, you know, China is growing very rapidly and we all have to be, acknowledge that and, and work with it, not work against it. Uh, so the next question is, who will lead the Asia Pacific region after COVID-19 pandemic? Well, I would hope that um, the, middle, the middle ranking countries would. It's always a danger when a major power, such as the United States, China, or Japan, want to take a lead. Uh, there would be a greater acceptance of um, Korea, or Thailand, or Malaysia, or Indonesia, or even Australia. Uh, but these things take time to shake out. The most important issue that I remember from APEC is when and I was, I was just a foreign and trade minister. We would get together in a room on our own without any officials, and we would try and work, how, how do we do it? Here's a problem, it's a very political problem. None of us want to back down. But if we follow this particular formula, we can all be a winner. 
and no one seemed to be backing down and everyone everyone gets benefit from it it's it's not an easy thing because you know in the current uh, communications around the world it's hard to keep a secret it's hard to avoid the social media well it's a very good point because after all ASEAN was really established um, with only that small group of nations what seven or eight to begin with because of their worry about China and that goes that goes well back into the uh, the, the war in Korea and the war in Vietnam. Uh, I think those of us in the Asia Pacific who worked in the Asia Pacific, who spent a lot of time in the Asia Pacific, would always say ASEAN is a good central point to begin with because they can reach into North Asia, they can reach into East Asia, they can reach into South, South Asia, they can reach across the Pacific they can reach out to Australia and New Zealand. So they're, they're, to, my, to my mind, they're still a good pivoting point. Uh, there's another question. Uh, what is the long-term approach for the Commonwealth to take Chinese aggression in the Pacific area? Sorry, could you repeat the question? Uh, what is the long-term approach for the Commonwealth to take Chinese aggression in Indo-Pacific area? Oh, right. Okay. Well, uh, clearly, clearly, um, Commonwealth, you know, uh, uh, which I'm very familiar with, 50, 54 countries and, and uh, more than one third of the world's population. Commonwealth has never been able to deal very successfully with trade related issues. It's very much interested in issues, social issues. Uh, the, the rights of people to have their say. Uh, and of course, currently, uh, the Commonwealth is endeavouring to ensure that all its members uh, are true democracies that have regular elections, that have free press, independent judiciary, a parliament that is uh, supreme to the, the supreme body in the country. The Commonwealth is a very unifying force for those 54 countries. Uh, from time to time, they will uh, involve themselves in trade issues, as I did as the Secretary General, health issues. Uh, and, I, and I think, I do believe in relation to this pandemic, the Commonwealth has a distinctive and appropriate role in helping small states manage uh, the, the devastation of, of COVID-19. And I'm talking about the small states in the Indian Ocean, Caribbean, the Pacific, because this is 33 or 34 members of the Commonwealth are small states. And they've always been able to work very well together by unifying and ensuring that they can all follow best practice as found by one or two of them. So the Commonwealth would have a place, but it won't be in the same role as uh, larger countries, but it will always endeavor to ensure that its values, its uh, attachment to universal values are well known. Uh, similarly, the next question is, uh, will the interests of great power in Asia lead to most conflicting area in the world? Will Indo-Pacific, uh, Asia Pacific become a very conflicting uh, zone of uh, conflict? You know, I suppose that one of the first lessons you learn as a foreign minister is that great powers are always great powers. They like you to know that they're great powers. They expect you to listen to them because they're great powers. But you do have to challenge great powers. You do have to challenge them on the basis of are they adhering to universal values? Uh, can they separate their great power, uh, non climature with being a good global citizen? Can they separate out the demands of their domestic political agenda or the domestic uh, economic agenda from being a great power? 
and that's where they do have great difficulties. Uh, there's many examples of great powers. The United States, you know, sort of crushing uh, some industries in Latin America because of the uh, size of the, the dole, the dole people who produced most of the world's pineapples. The way that the United Kingdom used to dominate uh, its many, many uh, uh, colonial members uh, merely because of their size and because they provided an enormous market and uh, telling countries like New Zealand, you know, don't bother getting into manufacturing, just sell us your agriculture products. So great powers always have to be told the truth. It's wonderful you are a great power, but you must adhere to positive human and social values. Well, there's another, another question on Quad. Uh, do you think quadrilateral uh, uh, alliance will be successful in balancing the power in the region? Sorry, so, uh, repeat it, please. Do you think Quad uh, of uh, US, Australia, India, and Japan will be successful in balancing power in the region? They do have the capacity to do so, but they've got to remember that they are Far, you know, four or five in the region only, they must be prepared to take their neighbors with them. They must be prepared not to, as I said before, beggar thy neighbor, make their neighbors poorer. They must act on behalf of others in a very positive way. And that's, that comes back to your <clears throat> earlier question, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the problem with big powers is they like to be big powers and their people often expect them to be big powers. If any of you have been watching um, President Trump's last uh, rally a few hours ago, it was all about, we are a big power and we will do what we want to do. Uh, there's one, another very interesting question. The US for 20 years, 24 years have gone without a strategy. If you're running the world and you are number one and you don't have a strategy for a quarter of a century, you have a problem. This is what uh, Keating in 2018 said. What is your view on US strategies in Asia Pacific? Well, I think, <clears throat> I think unfortunately, we probably have to wait till the elections out of the way before <laughs> in the United States before we hear what a strategy is. International politics and international relations do not always take a significant role in, in, the, in the politics of any one country's elections. A little bit different in the United States now because the United States is, has decided or President Trump has decided that China is the enemy. That's not a good thing. But you do hope that after the election uh, and you get away from this uh, uh, bellicose attitude towards who you are trying to crush or who you are trying to beat. Po international policy, international diplomacy should always be an aspiration for win-win. Both sides must win. We can't continue with what has been apparent in the last uh, four years with the United States must win so someone else may lose. And I hope that China realizes that to be an important player in the region, to be recognized in the region as to be a positive player, they've got to take up a different role than just wanting to be number one. Uh, no, United States is number one, China is number two. Uh, we don't need two major powers to be, be competing for who is number one. I'm prepared to say they should be number one equals and, and work accordingly to that. And if, if, if that can be achieved, uh, and I'm sure India would recognize that because India is a significant power, uh, we don't need that competition at that very high level. Major powers, superpowers, have to be far more magnanimous to the rest of the world than if they are not superpowers. Uh, another question is, uh, what are the major challenges to multilateralism in Asia-Pacific region? 
Well, I think I've probably covered them really. Uh, the challenges now are dealing with extreme nationalism, extreme populism, extreme, uh, I want to go it alone. Uh, we just got to get through all this and realize and continue to advocate that the, the, the greatest period of trade uh, and economic growth in the world happened in the 75 years since World War II when the influence of North America, United States and Canada, Europe, uh, NATO, uh, international trade kept the world relatively peaceful for those 75 years. And the result of that is a huge number of people have come out of poverty. China, wishing to engage with the rest of the world, has brought 500 million people out of poverty. It is not an easy exercise to do, but we've got to remind people that the climate to achieve that is really peaceful coexistence between many, many countries. Uh, so you just mentioned about India. So do you think India can emerge as a net security provider in Asia Pacific? India, I think, has enormous capacity. I was one who always felt that India could well surpass China. India is a true democracy and has been since 1947. China is not a democracy. China has not had five minutes of democracy in 5,000 years, uh, but they've become very successful. Uh, will it last? I do not know. India as a democracy should grow a lot faster. I was somewhat disturbed that uh, uh, some years back, uh, India just did not allow the Doha round to come to a conclusion. I think it should have. It would have been painful domestically for India to do so but it would have been better for the whole world and ultimately India too. So India's got to see itself more as an international citizen, less as a national citizen. And like China and the United States should be, be more magnanimous to the smaller nations. Uh, thank you, sir. We, we, we are running out of time, so we'll just pose two more questions. Uh, is the Chinese involvement in Asia Pacific region a security concern for New Zealand? I don't believe so. There would be others who say otherwise. China has not shown itself to be a hegemonic country. Uh, yes, they are, do have claims in the South China Sea. They do clearly have a claim on uh, Taiwan and, of course, the relationship with. Hong Kong has been somewhat uh, difficult in recent times, but I don't see them beyond that. They clearly want to have uh, access to, to markets which will help them. They initiated the Belt and Road uh, Initiative, which I fully support because if there can be a greater flow of goods both ways, between China and the rest of the world through various um, avenues which are made more possible by uh, lower, tar lower border barriers and such things like that, that can only be good for the rest of the world. I, I, you know, I visit a factory in China where uh, a million vehicles a year are being produced uh, for the Ford Motor Company and all of those vehicles are going straight through to West Germany. That is good. Good for China, good for Germany. And those are the sort of things that can be assisted by uh, clear, open highways for trade. Uh, so you just mentioned about Belt and Road. I think half of the, uh, you have almost answered this question, the last question, which is, what is New Zealand's stand on China's Belt and Road Initiative? Well, as you, as you said at the beginning, I'm the chairman of the New Zealand China Council and I have uh, come out and supported the Belt and Road because I think it does 
open up trade alternatives and trade options for many countries. Uh, I, I'm not sure my government has been as enthusiastic as I have been, but that, that doesn't matter. Uh, look, we're a trading nation, and I gave you our trading figures. We now trade with 130 countries around the world, so the easier we can get our goods to those countries, so much the better for New Zealand. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for your time. We are really grateful uh, that you provided us your valuable comments. It was really interesting, comprehensive and enlightening presentation and discussion. I would like to hand over the floor to Rithik for a formal vote of thanks. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the NICE team, we would like to thank Right Honorable Sir Donald Charles McKinnon. He has had the record of excelling in every field he has worked in. And we are very grateful to you for giving us such an enriching session, sir. We hope to stay connected in the future and invite you to other events of ours. On behalf of the NICE team, we would also like to express our sincere appreciation to Dr. Pramod Jaswal, Research Director NICE, and Ms. Sumitra Karki, Program Coordinator and Research Associate, Associate at NICE. Thank you everyone for attending today's event. We hope you enjoyed the session. Do check out our social media handles to keep up with our future activities and events. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank sir. you very much. Many thanks. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much. Have a nice day.